Hi, everyone. It's Brian Lizenby from Lizenby Immigration Law, and I'm reaching out to everyone today for part one of a 10-part series on evaluating your EB1A eligibility. So the reason it's a 10-part series is because most of the applicants that reach out to my firm to process their EB1A uh, qualify for the EB1A because they meet three, at least three, of 10 separate criteria that USCIS has deemed people are required to meet in order to receive a EB1A green card, which an EB1A green card, for those of you who don't know, is for individuals of extraordinary ability. So USCIS explains that to qualify for this EB1A, you have to either get that one-time achievement, meaning you get a really amazing prize or award like a Grammy, Golden Globe Award, Olympic medal, or you get to meet one of those three, one, three, at least three of those 10 criteria I mentioned earlier. So the 10 criteria are evidence that you have received lesser nationally or internationally recognized prizes, two, evidence that you have memberships in associations in the field which demand outstanding achievement of their members, three, evidence of published material about you in professional or major trade publications or other major media, four, evidence that you have been asked to judge the work of others individually or on a panel, five, evidence of your original scientific, scholarly, artistic, athletic, or business-related contributions of major significance to the field, six, evidence of your authorship of scholarly articles in professional or major trade publications or other major media, seven, Evidence that your work has been displayed at artistic exhibitions or showcases. Eight, evidence of your performance of a lean or critical role in distinguished organizations. Nine, evidence that you command a high salary or other significantly high remuneration in relation to others in the field. Or 10, evidence of your commercial successes in the performing arts. Or if you're extraordinary in some other way, you should include evidence of your extraordinary ability in your petition. So you have to meet at least three of those 10. A lot of candidates meet more than three. Um, some people just meet three, uh, but as long as you meet three of the 10, you can file for EB1A and then you have to pass um, the second part of the test using the Kazarian standards, which basically says that you have to be extraordinary. You, you can't just be meet those three objective criteria. You have to um, actually be well known throughout your field of expertise and what i like to tell people is usually in the, what that means is in the top 10 percent of your field um you've achieved the highest standards of success for for individuals in that profession your chosen profession um, and as long as you can prove that to uscis adjudicator then you can receive this immigration benefit of the eb1a green card so First step, uh, evaluating your lesser prizes or awards. And this is the first bullet. I just wanna talk briefly about how you can evaluate your qualifications for lesser prizes or awards. So um, basically, and, and, and in all honesty, this criteria is one I actually haven't filed with as often as some of the others. And that's because people don't get awarded things as often as they publish things or things are published about them or they receive a high salary. It's just not as common for someone to receive a reward. So when you do receive a reward, it's a really easy way to show USCIS that, yeah, you've achieved something great in your chosen profession. And they can't really argue with that because you have an award proving that you have done something amazing. So um, when a USCIS adjudicator approaches somebody and questions their lesser known awards that are internationally or nationally recognized, they consider questions such as the following. So what standards were used to endow the prize or, or award? What is the notoriety of the reviewer granting the prizes or, or the award? How new is the award? How long has it been around? Um, how well known is it? Does it have a strong history of being granted to people with extraordinary ability? Who in the past has received the award? Um, who are the applicants applying to the award? Are we drawing from a large pool of candidates? Um, is the award significant? Does it progress you in your field? Um, how were you selected for that specific award? Um, how many awards or prizes are given? Who can apply? Um, 
and on. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things that they can consider when they're evaluating someone's eligibility for an EB1A. But if you've won an award, I mean, it's easy if you can show them that it actually is a really important award that um, you meet one of those, one of those standards. So um, how do you prove that you've met those standards? How do you show them? How do you answer those questions so that they can see your award is actually significant? Well, you're going to want to show them a copy of the prize or the award. Um, and I like to show a picture of the person actually holding the award. If you can have a picture with you shaking someone that's really important's hand, receiving the award from them, then that's, that's really powerful. And I think when I say someone that's really important, I mean, uh, someone that has is a leading researcher in your field or someone that has won the prize in the past or someone that we've heard of in the news media. Um, if you have a picture with somebody that's, that's really great evidence and we can share a little blurb in your petition about who that person is and why, why they were the one giving you or granting you that award. That's good evidence. Uh, you can receive a letter from the award committee stating the criteria to receive the award, um, information about the reputation of the organization granting the award, statement regarding who applied for the award and where they are located in the world, evidence of funding uh, for for a venture cap from a venture capital firm or angel investor. So basically, if you got an awarded amount and, and your award was money, um, why that venture capital firm chose you or that investment group chose you. Um, criteria from the website, from a leaf book, for, leaflet or a rule book, media coverage of the award and uh, media coverage of the award from newspapers or media outlets of international or national circulation is even stronger. Evidence regarding past winners, how many awards or prizes have been given, proof that the prize is important to your field, et cetera. If we have evidence of that, then it's going to make the petition even, even stronger. So when, when I do reach out to somebody to evaluate their EB1A, I have noticed a lot of times clients will approach me and they'll send me a lot of awards they were given during their time as a PhD student. A lot of EB1A applicants have received a PhD. That's not a requirement, but um, it's common, especially for those applying as scientists in some, some field. Um, they'll, they'll send me a list of awards they've received. And a lot of times it includes scholarships, grants, fellowships, best poster awards, uh, travel grants, et cetera, other, other types of student awards. And that is helpful information. That's information you need to share. I like sharing their presentations in our petitions we send to USCIS. That's, that's good evidence. Um, it's usually better evidence to show that you're actively engaged in your field still and that you're progressing your field and that you've contributed something great to your field. So I usually use that evidence more for the original contributions prong and not for the awards prong. And the reason for that is student awards are typically more, re they're more local, right? If you if you get an award, I went to the University of Nebraska here in Lincoln to get my um, law degree. And if I received a reward from my law school, then I would have been competing with people from my law school. And it, usually that's the case. It, and if that's the case, then those awards usually aren't as strong. So like, um, for example, I received a scholarship when that's the reason I came to Nebraska and the pool of applicants for that scholarship were people applying to the University of Nebraska College of Law. Uh, that's not a super diverse group of people. It's not national. It's not going to be great evidence to show that I would have been an extraordinary ability because of that scholarship, right? Um, better would have been there's a lot of competitions held at the law school and like a client counseling competition. And if I would have won that award or the international mediation competition where teams compete from India, from China, from Scotland, from all over the world. And I did compete on the me international mediation team and we, we won one year, the um, client attorney side of that competition. And that would be an example of award that had international recognition. So that, that could be useful, but things that are local in nature, not, not as useful. Um, oh yeah. So other examples of school-based awards that might be, might actually work that aren't like scholarships or travel grants would be like, if you received a Fulbright scholarship or um, external fellowship from somewhere or an award that has applicants from multiple universities spread across the nation or spread across the world. Um, other things you should consider are if you're utilizing a team award, 
you should be prepared to present evidence showing your contributions to that team because individual rewards are usually um, better evidence for the EB1A. That's not saying a team award can't be great, uh, but if you do receive a team-based award, you should be prepared to just show evidence that you contribute significantly to achieving that, that great uh, benefit. So uh, just something to consider. Um, also, you can use nominations and second or third place awards in certain circumstances. I usually don't like to, but um, let's say, for example, you want an Olympic silver medal, that's second place. That's pretty extraordinary. Like you're going to file showing that you got an Olympic silver medal, right? Or if you had a Grammy nomination or a nomination for a Golden Globe, we're going to include that in your petition, right? So uh, it's good just to to know sometimes that can be helpful. Usually it's not, but in certain cases, second or third place nominations can be helpful evidence as well. Uh, gathering the correct evidence and gathering a lot of evidence is critical because you are trying to show a USCIS adjudicator that you are extraordinary and how that is presented is critical. So my advice is seek out an attorney, get some advice, but uh, use your use your awards. If you have them, include them in your petition. Again, this is Brian Lisenby. You can reach us at 402-601-9447, or you can visit our web website at lisenbyimmigrationlaw.com, and we can help you evaluate your EB1 case. Thanks, and have a great day, everyone.